Okay, I'm trying uh, an experiment here. I am uh, finishing my walk, listening to music, feeling like I'm not making the most of my time uh, because I'm uh, under the traditional Western notion that uh, nothing is ever good enough. Uh, to just be present is not enough. And uh, as a result, what I need to be doing is driving myself insane. And that's what I'm doing by recording this podcast while try to take a relaxing walk. And my idea was I wanted to comment on the homes and apartments that I see as I walk by, starting with this one, which looks really cool. Um, black and white trim. There's a lot of black and white trim. I like, I like the black and white trim. I like what that evokes. It, maybe it reminds me of growing up, because that's, that's how my mother decorated in the late 80s, early 90s. There was a lot of black marble, white leather furniture. It felt like the uh, office of uh, an 80s villain in a cop movie. Like, I feel like conversations that should have been had involved, well, where exactly is the cocaine shipment, and does Axel fully know? Because if he knows, then we need to take him out. That's the kind of conversation that you should have in a place that's decorated by my mother, basically. All right, so we covered that. Now we're moving on to this this lovely apartment here, which they decided to paint half the wall peach and the other half white. And the, I like the I like the peach. It, I'm, it's, I'm growing on the peach. It, it took me a minute. I think I like it because it, it says there is a God and there's hope. And you know that's that's a great way to put on the front of the building. The back of the building is all black and you know despair, but the front of the building. White and peach. I, I like, I like that. Then there's this. This is, a, this is the kind of thing where it's an apartment building, and the roof of the apartment, they're trying to sort of, kind of make it look like it's a 19th century cottage, but it is obviously a you know 10 room apartment. And I don't know. That always has bothered me. We know it's an apartment. We know it's prefabricated housing. Don't try to. Don't try to subtly suggest that this could take place, that this apartment exists in, you know, 1300s Germany. Come on, we know it's not the Shire. I almost prefer when it, when it doesn't look, when it looks ultra modern. Same thing with this apartment right here. Yeah, there are these, they, they, they've even put in a little bit of, uh, a little bit of the like stonework on the side of part of the apartment building. And this is an apartment building that says, I am so successful, I can lease an apartment building in Burbank, which means I'm making billions of dollars a year. That's how expensive it is to be in Burbank. I'm sure whatever they're paying for one of these units, if they went to any other part of the country, they would own that part of the country. So that just pisses me off when I look at it. That stonework, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I get it, I get it. You guys are successful. I'm a failure. Fine. All right, this apartment we're coming up on now. Kind of Spanish mission style. So the, the wall is made to look like, you know, kind of that plaster stucco thing and then the, the roof. It's a very Spanish mission style. This is an apartment that evokes uh, you know, the first wave of conquerors coming through as opposed to the second wave. And if it's one thing I like to do when I'm looking at an apartment or living in an apartment, it's remembering that, that, that we white Europeans, we weren't the first people to destroy cultures. There were, there were, there were people before that. Actually, uh, this particular set of white Europeans, because, the, the, yeah, technically the conquistadors were the first set of white Europeans. But then after that came my white European. But then again, my ancestors specifically didn't come over until the, the uh, early part of the 20th century. But still, I, I still feel guilty. That's what I like to do. I can, I can, sooner or later, I can find a way to feel guilty about anything, even architecture. Okay, now we're coming across this apartment building that has uh, turquoise and uh, peach 
coloring and and they have uh, on the windows it, there's this uh, frosted glass uh, artwork that looks like it's the ocean so this this is an apartment that says we are at the beach when in reality it is an hour away from the beach so good good attempt good try on that one I like where you're going with that that's some good marketing right there it's beach adjacent I mean it would be 20 minutes away from the beach if there was no traffic so during the pandemic it was this apartment actually made more sense but now that I look at it you know more accurately if they want to depict where it's adjacent to specifically there should be you know mountains and an Ikea that should be on the frosted glass that would be more accurate all right what's next um, I walked past another building while I was having that discussion that is so boring um, it was better for me to continue talking about the beach apartment all right then we move on to this one yeah this one's boring but I like it there's a lot of potted plants in front of it they're really trying to overcompensate with the boringness of the building by having a ton of pot like there's a ton of potted plants oh there's at least 20 potted plants that's an interesting that's an interesting technique pay no attention to the building look at these potted plants another building with stone makes me angry all right then there's these apartments how do I describe these it's a mix of wood paneling that almost reminds me of the ski lodge or maybe in a way also kind of far eastern so I kind of I, I kind of like this it's subtle and then there's kind of off-white stucco it's kind of unassuming it's unassuming but uh, but a little bit upscale like if this apartment were a person this is you know this is someone who knows their wine bars but doesn't advertise it I would call this the closet hipster apartment you know very competent very nice if this apartment were a person they would totally be like a, a sound engineer at a studio at a major movie studio sorry they're mulching either uh, foliage or people over there yeah well there's my little walking tour of Burbank I don't want to give specifics because uh, if I become a billionaire maybe with luck I'll be able to live in one of those one day but uh, yeah this this is podcast worthy right okay I'm going to uh, record the rest of this podcast now sitting here in uh, my office and uh, yeah, it's going to be kind of a, a, a lopsided podcast because at first, uh, a couple of days ago, I recorded myself uh, making fun of apartments, and now I'm going to record myself um, having a nervous breakdown. And I think between those two, we're going to cover a lot of bases. I, uh, is it, I've been trying to, I've been making these TikTok videos, which are basically just vlogs. I've been vlogging on TikTok. I've been, a, I'm, a, I'm a TikTok vlogger. What, what did you say he did for a living? He was a TikTok vlogger. And when we say for a living, yeah, not really. And I, uh, and I remember, and, and I actually tried making a little sketch, a, a, a Dune parody, a, a 30 second Dune parody. And I used to love writing those kinds of parodies and, and filming those kinds of parodies. And I, and I did the little parody thing and I put it up and I watched it and I immediately hated it. <laughs> And I think I have I have lost my love for um, acting and writing screenplays and sketches. I think all I'm really interested in now is stand up. Uh, and this is kind of a I remember it in in theater school. I had a professor who said you hate acting. And at the time, I was like, that's, that's ridiculous. Egad, man, that is ridiculous. And now, 
I think he may be onto something. Um, I think I may hate acting. Uh, I enjoy... All I really enjoy doing now is... Uh, is 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 the stand up comedy which is a it's a great it's really a great time to make this revelation in an era where it's harder than ever to do stand up comedy uh, I'm glad to know I've finally found my calling um it's great it's I've joked about this with Paul who I work with in the office here like you think <laughs> it's like you know 1935 and there's somebody who's like I really want to be a cowboy that's still possible right that's still a thing. You know, will there even be stand-up comedy? Is stand will stand-up comedy be able to continue in this post-COVID world? I certainly hope it will be. I don't know that Zoom is a, um, a replacement. I think it's a, it, it is a, um, and a, a, and a, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, um, an add-on. It's a uh, an auxiliary component. It's a, a supplementary component, but not the not the end-all, be-all. I think still being able to perform live in front of people, there's something powerful in that. And I really, it's going to be a really sad thing if we can never get back to that point. Um, I mean, they're saying there's a light at the end of the tunnel with this coronavirus crisis. Uh, you know, we're in the home stretch. That's what they keep saying. But, you know, I, I hope they're right. I hope there's not going to be another variant that comes along or, you know, more uh, diseases are going to be released as we destroy the environment where this becomes a, you know, a thing that happens every five years. That really is uh, my fear. But the, the thing, the realization I'm having or the existential crisis I'm having is that I, I suddenly, you know, I, I all ha I had my whole life mapped out in my head, which is nothing like reality. And what I saw was, I, you know, I wanted to be have a career kind of like, you know, Woody Allen or Louis C.K., minus the scandals, people, minus the scandals, where, you know, I'm making one movie a year or writing a novel a year or, you know, doing, and then doing stand-up. And now just the urge to make a movie or even write a movie or the urge to do any kind of acting has just disappeared and all that's left is you know i just love uh i love doing stand-up and that's all i want to do so there's you know and and this may change again maybe there'll, there'll come a point where i uh i don't even want to do that and all i will want to do is um go kayaking <laughs> uh, that suddenly I'll just I'll be like I need to be a kayaker is that what they're called it's not a kayakist it's a ki are they called a kayaker I'm a kayaker professional kayaker what about him he's a TikTok vlogger okay I'd like to write a movie about a TikTok vlogger and a kayaker an unlikely duo who go on an adventure down the river. It's called Lewis and the TikTok vlogger. I'm trying to think of something that fit with Clark. Lewis and Clark. Take off of Lewis and Clark. And it didn't happen, people. It didn't happen. Some days you get the bear. Some days the bear gets you. Which is an interesting phrase because I think that how it should be more realistically is that so, some days you get the bear and then on the last day of your life the bear gets you. <laughs> because the implication is that the bear getting you, that you're going to walk away from that and then get the bear a couple of days later, maybe. But I think, at least the way my body is designed... Some days I will get the bear. Uh, no days. No days I will get the bear. I will never get the bear. The bear will get me if I'm not careful. And that is why I avoid the woods. At all times. That is why I avoid the woods at all times. 
The closest I get to the woods is walking around nice residential areas in Burbank. That's good enough. There's, there's a squirrel. There's a hummingbird. Nature. Oh, there's some potted plants. That's, you know, foliage. I'm good. I am good. But what, pray tell, then, is my future? I always live in the future. I always uh, do this thing where I live in the future. And I think the only thing I want to do, my, my big goal is, you know, once a year, I want to make either an album or a special. And I, I uh, did one last year, a Zoom comedy special that is up for free on my YouTube and on my Facebook page. Uh, and, uh, and that's what, uh, that, you know, it's a 30 minute special that David P. Cronmiller directed. It's free to watch. Please watch it. Please share it. And now I'm working on the one for next year. And every year I want to come out with a new, uh, special. I think the big thing I would like to do is on the special this year, I would like to have jokes. <laughs> uh, I want it. I want what I do to be more, um, uh, I want the, the, the joke structure to be tighter, but at the same time, I don't want to, um, I don't want it to feel like I've, you know, done it within an inch of its life. So I, I need to come up with, this is why, this is why I love Eddie Izzard, by the way, because he's very, very precise. But when I watch him, when I watch his specials, it really feels like, it really feels like he's saying a lot of it for the first time. And he did say, I think that he he designs his uh, he designs his routine so that he can improvise within the structure. And I'm wondering if you know that that's kind of I'm I'm really excited about that notion of having enough of a structure, but being able to improvise within that structure so that it always feels new to me, without the quality of it, you know, lessening. And it is organic to the moment. Um, I'm a big... Uh, that really... I find that attractive. I find that very attractive. I find that attractive. But I am... Um, yeah, I'm just not feeling... Uh, not feeling the, uh, the whole acting thing. I'm holding this... Uh, by the way, somebody got me a... Uh, uh, original series mini Starship Enterprise that's like a little model that's glued to a spring. Kind of like it's a knickknack you, you know, put on the wall or, you know, on your desk. And all I can think of is that the, the model, like this little plastic model, is not exactly like the ship in the series. The proportions are not quite right. The neck is uh, too fat. The, um, the deflector dish is not the copper color it should be. The uh, sensor dome on the bottom of the primary hull is too large. Uh, and I think the nacelles are longer than they're supposed to be. And the primary hull also, I think, needs to be larger than it is. It's just, I'm very, I'm very frustrated with this situation. This is, I cannot stand when a toy does not look exactly like the thing in the TV show that it is supposed to look like. They think I don't notice, but I notice! That happened with Star Trek First Contact. They came out with the Enterprise E, the toy. The, the toy model of the Enterprise E, and they... Uh, I learned this on Junk Ball Media, by the way, if you want to follow that channel. Uh, they designed the toy based on preliminary sketches of the ship, not the final design for the movie because they wanted the toy to be released in time for the movie, so they had to, you know, build it before they were done designing it. And so it's, it's not, it doesn't look exactly like the ship in the movie, and it drives me crazy. It drives me crazy. It should have two impulse uh, drives, not one, and there should be a little uh, dividing thing uh, in, uh, in the buzzard collectors. It, it, I, it drives me up the wall, and the... Uh, the uh, connectors the, that connect the, uh, the, the nacelles from the secondary hull, uh, the, the struts or whatever they're called, uh, they're not the right shape. It just, I look at, it's an affront. It is an affront. That's what it is. 
and I can't, I can't let it go. You know, I can play with it for a minute and then go, ah, I can't, I just, I can't do this. I have to invent a reason why this doesn't look, maybe, you know, this isn't the Enterprise, this is another ship. Or maybe this was the, you know, the, maybe they did a refit uh, that you see off screen. I got to do something because they do not match and it bothers me to no end. All right. This was, I, I enjoy what came of this podcast. Hopefully you will. We'll see.